And now we're going to hear from Washington, D.C. Data feeds, dem democrat democratization of de government data with Christopher Wiley and David Striegel. And it's uh, Chris Willie. Good afternoon. Oh, Willie, okay, excuse me. No, that's all right. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of Mayor Fenty, we're proud to present the, this program of the District of Columbia to you today. Uh, may I add, Mayor Williams, it's an honor to uh, stand before you today. One of the most important accomplishments of ancient Athens was the formation of a direct democracy organized into three institutions, the Assembly of the People, the Council of 500, and the People's Court. The Athenian model ensured that the affairs of state were conducted openly and, in fact, cooperatively with all members of society. Plato wrote that speeches in the assembly were made by blacksmiths, merchants, shoemakers, shippers, rich, poor, the grand, and the humble. In our representative democracy, it's far too easy for the affairs of state to be conducted in secret behind closed doors. We have established laws such as the Freedom of Information Act to help private citizens gain access to the inner workings of government, but there continues to exist a lack of trust between the people and their elected leaders. What is needed is a way for citizens to engage directly with the process of government, to enable true participatory democracy. This starts with information. Typically, information provided to citizens from government is in a prepackaged report that is outdated by the time the report is published. What we did in the district is provide access to data direct from the source. Internally, the data feeds are the backbone of the CAPSTAT program, the mayor's initiative to drive decision making and accountability in CAPSTAT sessions, analysts can access the data feeds in real time to answer questions posed by the mayor and other participants. From these sessions, the mayor made and has tracked commitments to create 10,000 affordable housing units, institute focused improvement areas to fight crime, and reduce the city's fixed costs. This real-time access to over 270 data feeds allows the mayor to hold agency directors accountable. Outside government, Ordinary citizens have begun using the data in ways we hadn't anticipated. For example, a resident created the website jdland.com to report on changes to the southeast waterfront area of the district using crime and building permit data we have online. The site recently won an award by the Knight Foundation. An advisory neighborhood commissioner built six mini applications with our data that help him monitor government performance in his area. Less than a week after we posted data regarding government credit card purchases, the Washington Post ran a story on questionable line items. A FOIA request for the same information would have taken weeks or months. In other words, people aren't just consuming our data. They're creating things with it. In some cases, they're even making money with it. Rather than try to change this trend, we decided to capitalize on it. In the fall of 2008, we started a contest called Apps for Democracy. The idea was simple. Let the software developer community build applications using the data, and we'll award prizes to the best ones. We thought we might get a handful. Instead, we got back 47 applications in just 30 days. These applications cover all sorts of interests, from crime to biking to historic buildings to trying to find a parking space. This year, we're holding our second Apps for Democracy contest, dubbed Community Edition, in which we solicit insights and ideas from district residents before apps are developed. Our efforts have been rewarded with imitators. Apps for Democracy has counterparts in Europe, Canada, and elsewhere in the United States. Also, the federal government just last week released data.gov, which provides feeds from several federal agencies. And the fact is, we were the first city to make data available as data, not as reports or static documents. This is a testament to the mayor's priority of transparent government. But technology alone cannot make you transparent. You also need the will to operate transparently. Our innovation, then, is not only the data warehouse, nor our hundreds of data feeds, business intelligence tools, databases, or reporting engines. It's also our government's willingness to provide data in its raw form, straight from internal systems and fed directly to citizens, to be consumed, mashed up, and reused in town hall meetings, newspaper editorials, activist websites, or whatever other forms the people wish to use to remind government who it works for. Technology is a sidebar, though an important one, for technology provides a simple, open, and nearly ubiquitous enabling mechanism for people to get the unvarnished truth and share it, comment on it, create new things with it, and even vote on it. The district has democratized data by making it available on demand to anyone at any time in as many formats as possible. 
Thank you very much for selecting the District of Columbia as a finalist for this prestigious award. We will be happy to answer any questions you have. Carl. Is there, can you think of it, any instance of information or data that would be available through FOIL that wouldn't be posted as a live feed? Uh, in a word, no. Thank you. Um, I can understand very clearly how the Washington Post would love this. <laughs> and I can under <laughs> understand very clearly how young, tech-savvy people with, who don't have kids yet and have time on their hands would have a lot of fun with this. <laughs> what I have trouble getting my ha hands around, though, is how has it actually changed the quality of life for district residents? Uh, I think we have a number of indicators to that effect. Um, first of all, there's, a, there's sort of, there's consuming data. In other words, going onto the website, clicking on an Excel file, downloading it, using it. And then there's also benefiting from data. Um, if you look at the Apps for Democracy contest, which you can think of as a way of creating front ends to all this data, people are actually benefiting from the data by looking at those applications. I live .ad is a great example. Uh, simply type in your, your address and you find out what banks are in your area, uh, what the demographics are of your area, where crime has occurred, uh, where the nearest supermarket is, these types of things. Um, so we believe and we've seen uh, that by creating these apps for democracy contests, we're actually creating new ways for people to consume and use the data in, in ways that may be meaningful to them. In, in the past, just to add to that, um, having the data all in one location, service requests and crime data, They've taken you know, the two different data sets from different agencies that may never have been overlaid with each other and found uh, correlations or um, you know, basically they took crime data and abandoned autos and they found that if they cleaned up the abandoned autos and cleaned up the city in general, the crime uh, reduced or you know, basically dropped. So um, those are real hard uh, impacts to the quality of life in DC. Ellen, so um, one possibility next step would be to work with a set of community-based organizations and nonprofits yes. in D.C. to help them understand how to use this data to, to follow on David's point that the 27-year-old might not need your help in figuring it out, but the community-based groups might. Do you have any plans to do any of that work? Uh, absolutely, and I believe in the, in the first Apps for Democracy contest there was at least one NGO that created an application or funded an application anyway. So we, we've done some of that already, uh, and we definitely have plans to reach out to, to more. And actually, in the, in the community edition of Apps for Democracy, the, the big part of it initially was to go out and solicit feedback and insights from residents directly. Uh, we're getting some of that from the NGO community as well. In addition, um, some of the NGOs have uh, data requests for us, so they're actually mm -hmm. going to turn into customers. They have uh, specific data sets that they want us to add to the data catalog, so we'll be working with what them. Would an example of that be? Um, well, this year, um, in particular, they want a lot more economic uh, type data, and um, so we'll be working towards that this year. Um, I was wondering, do you have, uh, on, in part of your data sources, um, do you have how much uh, is spent on a single school? Say one more time. How much money is, on a, is spent on a school? We found, you know, for instance, we found that older teachers tend to teach in certain neighborhoods, so that actually the better luckier neighborhoods have really more money spent on them because, uh, so it's actually kind of interesting to be able to compare if you have, yeah. er, and, I've, and I've not seen that publicly done. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, we don't. So that if you had all the, you know, how much they're paid, their Definitely. benefits, then you're really comparing school A versus school D, and you'll see that school D, which is more needy. Yes. Well, anyway. we think there are huge opportunities in the, in the education area. We don't have anything on site right now. Part of that is because the Office of the State Superintendent of Education is engaged in creating a data warehouse of just this data, uh -huh. and we'll be working very closely with that office to make sure it's incorporated. Great. Well, I have to tell you, I grew up in Washington, always praying to St. Anthony to find a parking space, so I'm glad I did. <laughs> <laughs> Giving another option. <laughs> That's right. Uh, any other questions? <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You.